Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> uh, warm welcome to our panelists and attendees of the webinar, uh, Heritage and Resilience, Building a Symbiotic uh, Relationship, held as part of ECROM's lecture series. Uh, for those of you uh, who are joining us for the first time, uh, ICROM, the International Center for the Study of Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, is the intergovernmental organization working in service to its 137 member states for promoting the conservation of all forms of cultural heritage in every region of the world. Um, <clears throat> let me start uh, with uh, the words of noted historian and philosopher Yuval Noah Harari, uh, and I'll just share my screen here. So uh, Mr. Harari says, uh, in response to the current crisis triggered by COVID-19 pandemic, uh, humankind is now facing a global crisis, perhaps the biggest crisis of our generation. The decisions people and governments take in next few weeks will probably shape the world for years to come. They will shape not just our healthcare systems, but also our economy, politics, and culture. We must act quickly and decisively. We should also take into account the long-term consequences of our actions. When choosing between alternatives, we should also ask ourselves not only how to overcome the immediate threat, but also what kind of world we will inhabit once the storm passes. Yes, the storm will pass. Humankind will survive. Most of us will still be alive, but we will inhabit a different world. So <clears throat> what would this different world look like? What will change? What will remain the same? Uh, what new aspects will emerge? Clearly, this black swan, black swan event has made us reflect on many fundamental elements of our existence and of our future ridden with uncertainty. It has also made us think of those underlying causes that we need to address in order to reduce the risk of such pandemics in the future. And in this context, we need to reflect on the role of cultural heritage in this different world, and also how we reconfigure our actions to safeguard it. The concept of resilience had gained significant traction in past few years and applied to various fields. And this crisis has again made us reflect on this term. However, there is general lack of clarity on what resilience means and therefore it ends up getting misused as a jargon. Unfortunately, many times we have found that people struggle to survive in these adverse situations may get wrongly branded as their resilience. Therefore, on one hand, we need to understand the term itself. We should also explore it in relation to heritage, especially as we go through COVID pandemic and emerge from it. Therefore, the objective of this webinar is aimed at reflecting on the symbiotic relationship between heritage and resilience in the context of post-COVID world. And we will explore this by posing the following questions. How should we understand resilience in the context of heritage? How should we relook at heritage in the context of resilience? What we need to do in order to build resilience of heritage in these uncertain times? How can heritage contribute towards building resilience of people in the context of current crisis? And what are the implications of resilience thinking on heritage conservation and management practice? We are indeed privileged uh, to be joined by a multidisciplinary group of uh, panelists who through their presentations will bring forward cultural, natural, social, economic and disaster risk dimensions of heritage resilience. I am delighted to introduce you to our panelists today and I will request them to, uh, to turn on their cameras. Uh, Dr. Leticia Letao 
consultant working on cultural and natural heritage mr bill kamni nature conservation professional dr kasenia chimutina from loughborough university uk and mr alicio re from foundotsane santa gata for the economics of culture before i proceed further uh, may i advise you of some procedures for housekeeping uh, during this webinar you can send your queries and comments via q and a icon that you see at the bottom of the zoom uh, window we will take up some questions after the presentations by our panelists in case we are unable to answer all the questions due to shortage of time please do send us an email and we'll surely get back to you so let me have the privilege of firstly inviting dr leticia letao an independent consult consultant working with cultural and natural heritage dr letao has coordinated several projects including the first two phases of connecting practice for iucn ecrom and ecomos focusing on capacity building and interlinkages between nature and culture dr letao will set the stage for this webinar through her introductory presentation on resilience thinking for cultural heritage so over to you leticia Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you, Rohit, uh, for the introduction. Uh, so, if I could, yes, share the screen. I'll stop my video to so that the connection works better. So, over the past years, resilience has become a very popular concept. I started to explore this concept a couple of years ago after a workshop where other colleagues and I were asked to consider this application in relation to world heritage and I realized that none of us really knew what it meant. In my presentation today, I'll share with you some of the things that I learned since then, mostly by studying how resilience is applied in environmental and social sciences. But let me state it up front. I am not an expert on resilience. Resilience thinking is now a field on its own and a very complex one. Therefore, my aim is to introduce you to some key ideas about resilience thinking in relation to social ecological systems and how they could be applied to cultural heritage. Resilience is now a concept that is widely used in different fields from psychology, environmental sciences, economics, disaster risk preparedness, etc. However, the concept is often misunderstood with people using the term without having a clear definition of what resilience actually means, let alone how to apply it. Resilience was originally introduced in the 1970s as a concept to help understand the capacity of ecosystems to react to perturbations. This idea of bouncing back is still at the center of how lots of people conceive resilience today, even though the concept has evolved over time more towards an approach of bouncing forward. At present, one of the most widely accepted definitions is that proposed by the Stockholm, Stockholm Resilience Center, which defines resilience as the capacity of a system, be it an individual, a forest, a city, or an economy, to deal with change and continue to develop. Change is always occurring. Most heritage places are the result of cumulative changes over time, be it through the different construction layers of an historical settlement, the erosion of an archaeological site, or the natural evolution of a landscape. Change is inherent to heritage. Yet, most conservation approaches tend to be based mainly on a past frame of reference or backward looking, aimed at maintaining heritage resources as unchanged as possible. For instance, the Borough Charter advocates a cautious approach to change, do as much as necessary to care for the place and make it usable, but otherwise change it as little as possible so that this cultural heritage is retained. This, approach to heritage, this, this type of approach adopts a static model of the heritage place which in many cases leads to an assumption that conservation and development 
are an either or proposition. However, if our goal is to protect heritage for present and future generations, its frame of reference needs to be the future as much as the past. Resilience thinking evolved over time beyond the core idea of persistence into a much richer approach by incorporating notions of adaptability and transformability. It might seem counterintuitive to include ideas of adaptation and transformation in order to maintain the resilience of a heritage place. However, these ideas are crucial because if the only focus is to resist change and control it to maintain stability, there is a risk that that place persists, but in an undesired state. Just think of the many heritage places whose built fabric persists, but is only used for tourism and are no longer, no longer vibrant living spaces, but more like museums or theme parks. In such cases, we can maybe speak of the resilience of the built fabric from a persistent perspective, but when every other building of an historic center becomes an Airbnb or a souvenir shop, that place has completely changed and transformed into something else. Note that throughout the presentation, I often refer to resilience thinking rather than just resilience. Resilience thinking refers to a conceptual framework of understanding how complex systems change, adapt, and evolve across scales of time and space. Whereas when we speak of resilience only, we tend to focus on the resilience of something. And then the question is to be, resilience of what to what? We cannot speak of resilience in absolute terms since we cannot build the resilience of all elements of a heritage place to all possible factors. For example, the resilience of the Trulli in the Alberobello in Italy to earthquakes is one thing, that resilience to changing living standards is another. So first we need to know where we are before we need to decide where we want to go. To do so, you need to have a good understanding of the current state of the heritage place, as well as the change dynamics affecting the place. This can then form the basis for identifying potential future states in order to define a desired trajectory or forward-looking approach. What do we expect the heritage place to be in a 20 or 30 years period? What is the model of development that we want? What is the long-term vision for the place? Protecting heritage places for future generations requires a frame of reference that should be anchored in the past but with a vision for the future. This can be achieved with the support of long-term management strategies informed by the use of potential scenarios of different development trajectories. Such strategies strategy should identify which heritage resources should persist in an original or static state persistence, which one should adapt, but within the same stability domain, adaptation, and which one should be allowed to transform into a different kind of resource or to become redundant and be replaced by new types of resources or elements, transformation. At the same time, we need to encourage constant learning. We live in a world of increase, increasing complexity and accelerating change. Therefore, we need to transition from what is called a plus approach, standing for predictability, linearity, understandability, and stability, to a dice approach where things are dynamic, impossibly to completely understand, complex, and never changing or evolving. This requires that site managers embrace a model of adaptive management able to respond to uncertainty and change. So some key messages to conclude. Heritage places, like any other systems, are not static, but are constantly changing. Change can be slow, 
or fast, as well as predictable or unexpected. The concept of heritage incorporates notions of persistence, adaptability, and transformability. And all these three aspects need to be considered simultaneously. That we cannot build the resilience of a heritage place in absolute terms, since we cannot build the resilience of all elements of that place to all possible factors. But we always need to ask, resilience of what to what? And that heritage places should be seen as complex and dynamic systems, which are the result of change over time, are always evolving, and will continue to do so in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leticia, for very eloquently giving historic background of resilience and critically analyzing its implication on heritage conservation approaches. Through the evolution of the core idea of persistence into notions of adaptability and transformability. Rather than bouncing back, your call for forward looking approach of resilience is indeed worth considering. We need to discuss practical ways and means for the site managers to apply the model of adaptive management in order to respond to uncertainty and change. Now, I am pleased to invite our next panelist. Mr. Bill Kenmir, who has 30 years of experience in nature conservation, has worked predominantly with RSPB, a UK environmental NGO. His presentation will focus on English Lake District, a recently inscribed World Heritage Site, which is under uh, a cultural landscape. So I will now welcome uh, Bill to make his presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rohit. I'll just wait for the presentation to come up. Um, and like Letitia, I'll just um, pause my video so you can concentrate on the slides. Um, welcome to the English Lake District, a newly inscribed World Heritage Site, the cultural landscape. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm not going to talk in resilience thinking language too much. Uh, my colleagues and Letitia, everyone can fulfill that role. Instead, I'm going to try and provide an overview of a real place in real time where the social ecological system feels at risk of collapse. And my contention is that this collapse is being precipitated by there being two parallel systems. There's a social system and an ecological system. And only by bringing these two systems together can we hope to avert that whole system collapse. I'll refer to custom and practice. And where I refer to custom and practice in this presentation, I'm, I'm broadly referring to the cultural system as is recognized by our world heritage status. And that's predominantly around the farm landscape. This recent publication um, looked at the key metrics that underline the health of the Lake District in terms of both its national park status and recent world heritage status. And a spoiler alert, it's, it's not good. The report identifies a series of strategic challenges, which in effect make up the full social ecological system. However, for simplicity, I'm going to focus on the top three challenges, climate change, nature recovery, and the state of farming. And remember, farming is, is, is the key cultural uh, value of the Lake District. Climate change is a single most pervading threat to both our natural and cultural systems. There's a strategic challenge of addressing climate change, and it will require significant changes to existing culture and practice. And with climate change, we need to make those changes now. We're the English Lake District, yet our lakes and rivers are in a very poor state. Triple SIs, sites of special scientific interest, are our most precious natural sites and are des designated both at UK and EU level. Yet under current practice, they're failing. 
The strategic challenge of improving our water resources will require significant changes to our existing, our existing culture and practice. And nature recovery, the Lake District can no longer be described as an e ecologically functional. And as such, it suffered severe declines in habitats and species, and these declines are ongoing. And again, the strategic challenge of delivering a recovery in nature is going to require significant changes to our existing culture and practice. If we think about the state of farming, the, the social part of the model, this is also in trouble. Livestock farming in mar marginally productive landscapes is non-profitable. Livestock systems in the UK uplands lose money. And by marginal, I'm referring to relatively unproductive agricultural land. Farming here persists because significant sums of public money through EU subsidies is spent on propping up loss making business models with very little of that money targeted towards the natural environment. And critically, that public money is at greater risk than ever and Brexit is accelerating that risk. The strategic challenge of addressing the state of farming is also going to require significant changes to our culture and practice. And just to illustrate the scale of the risk, this graph provides an analysis of Brexit risk to those UK marginal livestock farms. FBI stands for uh, farm business income, uh, farm profitability, if you like. And the green bar represents the 2015 baseline of farm profitability. So they weren't making much money. Importantly, subsidies are included in this graph. And you'll see the other color bars. Um, any reasonable Brexit scenario sends farm profitability over a cliff edge. And current negotiations around Brexit and trade indicate that the worst case scenarios at the moment are looking the most likely. So how can we move forward on these three things, climate change, nature recovery, and the state of farming? This report, less is more, pulls together the economic and environmental challenges we face. And through a number of economic case studies of livestock farming operations in our marginal agricultural landscapes, and it takes the premise that our farming systems and our natural environment are codependent and that both are at risk of collapse. And the key findings around this model, the key findings are that less intensive systems, those that run fewer livestock are actually more profitable as they operate, as they can operate within the natural constraints of the landscape. And we're moving beyond those natural constraints of the landscape adds considerable and unsustainable costs that destroy profitability. Now, this runs counterintuitive to both current farming business models and custom and practice. The findings also demonstrate that less intensive systems are inherently better for the natural environment. So less can really be more. Due to the economic findings being counterintuitive, there is a cultural resistance to the findings in this report. However, it is clear that there are potential win-win solutions and new opportunities that could accrue from a change of mindset. These include opportunities to improve the financial resilience of those marginal farm systems, opportunities to market sustainably, sustainably produced meat products as distinct from the global commodity meat products we're all worried about at the moment. There's opportunity here to create more space for nature, an opportunity to reduce the climate footprint of farm business operations. And critically, there's an opportunity here to develop good public policy and support post Brexit that could be in the form of public money invested in public goods, i.e. a targeted public investment in ecosystem service delivery, our life support system. However, cultural and institutional barriers to embracing change cannot be overstated. Those are significant barriers. So in summary, if we don't 
change and adapt, we're potentially facing a system collapse. We need to move away from the contested landscape paradigm as illustrated in this slide. Opportunities are out there, but they require new thinking and new collaborations. And critically, good public policy measures and support funding are needed to underpin a transition. Thank you. What an amazing case uh, that throws light on so many issues. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Bill, in his presentation, has aptly illustrated how cultural landscapes like the Lake District, which has recently been inscribed on the World Heritage List, can indeed become contested landscapes, where cultural and natural values are seen to be in competition, although there are notable exceptions on ground. Such landscapes also face significant cultural, economic, and natural challenges, which will require us to change traditional mindsets and develop collaborative approaches to move forward. Now I have the pleasure of requesting Dr. Ksenia Chimutina, Senior Lecturer in Sustainable and Resilient Urbanism at the School of Architecture, Building and Civil Engineering, Loughborough University, UK. Dr. Chimutina's research has largely focused on processes of disaster risk creation in urban areas, and she will be presenting to us disaster risk perspective of resilience. So over to you, Ksenia. Thank you, Rohit. Um, let me just share my screen with everyone and then we'll start. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for attending the webinar. Um, I shall, um, all right. So as already been noted, um, resilience is really a malleable term, um, but I think in the context of disasters, it's actually been used quite uh, prominently. Um, so we know that uh, there is no single definition, uh, but in disasters, uh, resilience is largely used um, as a desired outcome. So the focus of this concept is on surviving um, very high impact, relatively low frequency events and quickly getting back uh, to the basic functions. So getting these functions back. Um, for a long time, as Leticia has already noted, resilience has been interpreted as going back to normal, right? Or kind of bouncing back. Um, but the implications of using the ideas of bouncing back is that resilience policy tends to be reduced to emergency response uh, with an emphasis on short-term damage reduction and also recovery instead of actually dealing with chronic stresses. The question also remains whether um, after a disaster, the smartest choice is to return back to normal and what normal actually means. Um, and if a city experienced a disaster, that means that the original state was vulnerable, right? Um, and therefore, uh, it should not be a desirable state to go back to because it will perpetuate this vulnerability. But there is some value in the idea of bouncing back. And um, from the heritage perspective, a really good example of this um, is the historic city of York. So for those of you who are not in the UK, York is located um, at the confluence of rivers um, Ouse and Foss in North Yorkshire in England. And this city has a really rich heritage uh, and it has provided the backdrop for major political events in England throughout uh, much of its two millennia of existence. Um, York therefore has a large variety of cultural heritage sites, many of which are prone to climate induced hazards and in particular to flooding, as you can see here in the picture. So it is the same uh, building that you can see um, in the middle, but just being flooded. Um, many buildings have adapted over the years, um, and while some extra resilience measures have been implemented recently, many historic buildings, um, you know, they're kind of sort of ready to be affected because they cannot um, really uh, move forward. So they cannot do because they're protected buildings, they can't put many measures in place, so they have to be prepared to bounce back. Um, the city of York, of course, um, has put some uh, measures in place, in fact, various measures in place uh, to make the city more resilient. So there are lots of flood protection measures you can see on the pictures, you know, like raised um, door frames and also different uh, small flood defenses. Um, and they uh, do indeed have a big flood defense. But um, in winter 2015, the flood barrier broke down, leading to some very serious flooding. And so um, 
many people were left with the question, so what do we do? Do we adapt historic buildings um, to climate change or do we preserve them and gradually maybe letting them go? Uh, and of course, a difficult question as you can imagine. So rather than seeking to bounce back, um, failures, crises, and disasters may be an opportunity. And so instead, we are now encouraged to think about resilience as a bouncing forward idea, or um, in the UN terms, building back better. Um, however, what this opportunity means may have different interpretations. And Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and its impact on New Orleans um, and displacement of almost 400,000 residents uh, is a very well-known example of this. So um, as you probably know, the effects of Hurricane Katrina were wor worsened by uncertainty about uh, repairing levees and the complexity of the US governance system, but also by such factors as geography of poverty. Um, and at the time, many decision makers went as far as saying that actually the city should not be rebuilt or at least not in its original form. Um, and it may therefore be a very thin line between considering a disaster as an opportunity to kind of to fall forward and rebuild stronger and better and considering a disaster to be a unique moment to actually push out unwanted minorities and jump on the uh, bandwagon of neoliberal urban planning um, and seek economic gains over social equality and consequently completely um, damage the existing culture of a place uh, and turn its culture into kind of touristic attraction. Uh, so bouncing forward very often ends up being a recreation of risks that have already been there in the first place. Because when we try to build back better, we only focus on the immediate without taking into account structural, systemic, political, economic and social causes uh, that led to a disaster in the first place. So any disaster that is to happen in the future has already started and we need to bear this in mind. So when we're talking about building back better after a disaster, we are largely focusing on realization of risk, but we forget about the root causes, i.e. what this risk is driven by and how vulnerability is created. To an extent, such approach is very convenient um, because it allows governments who are often responsible for root causes to then blame losses on a hazard, right, i.e. on nature. But if we realize that disasters and hazards are not the same and that hazard only turns into a disaster when it interacts with root causes such as poverty or lack of access to resources, um, then we realize that disasters are socially constructed. And therefore disasters are never natural because discrimination and marginalization are not natural. So in order to understand what resilience in a context of disasters mean, we need firstly to not only understand resilience of what and to what, but also resilience by whom. And we need to realize that when we talk about building resilience in disaster context, there is no right or wrong, but there are good and bad, and that good and bad is determined by whoever is making a decision. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ksenia. Uh, through case study of the historic city of York, you very rightly mentioned that rather than seeking to bounce back, failures, crises, and disasters may be an opportunity to bounce forward. Uh, your presentation also highlighted the importance of considering structural, systemic, political, economic, and societal causes that led to disaster in the first place. And therefore, it is crucial that rather than only focusing on realization of risk, we need to pay considerable attention to addressing the root causes. It is just like a doctor, not only curing the symptoms, but addressing the underlying causes of the illness. So thank you very much again, uh, Ksenia. And now, last but not the least, may I invite Mr. Alessio Ray, Secretary General at the Fondazione Santagata for the Economics of Culture in Italy, his work is mainly focused on economic aspects of cultural heritage and its management. And he will be discussing the relationship between resilience and heritage from socioeconomic perspective. So over to you, Alessio. Thank you, Rohit. Hello, everyone. And thanks for this uh, opportunity. Uh, to, to, to share with you this, uh, this reflection today. So the goal of, of my presentation is basically to introduce some elements uh, possibly useful to understand the symbiotic relationship between resilience and heritage from a, a social economic perspective. 
um, our society is called to face radical changes like climate changes, social and demographic changes, the digital diffusion. These are the major ones characterizing our present and our future life. All these factors, including the last uh, sanitary COVID-19 emergency, are generating an uh, unprecedented call to action on how to respond to them. So if these uh, are, in very brief, the changes we are facing, let's think for a second on what's the meaning of, of heritage itself today. This picture, which was kindly provided by, by, by a friend of mine, shows the Church of St. George in Oms, Syria. And you can see, despite the fabric, uh, meaning what we are used to refer to as heritage, cultural heritage, despite this as being destroyed by the bombs, the community still gathered there for their ceremonies. So this case uh, uh, shows how the meaning of heritage, not only here, is obviously much larger than just the, the church itself, in this case, than just the fabric itself. So a first fundamental point, since we want to understand what's the relationship between heritage and change from an, a socioeconomic perspective, we must approach heritage as a capital, embedding uh, cultural values, of course, but also economic values. Let's take the case of Florence. Uh, the city that we know today was created clearly thanks to the economic power of the Medici family. And same we could say, for instance, for Venice and any other city, monument, architecture. So cultural heritage is a result of an economic process. And heritage clearly relates to the creation of economic impacts as well. Sometimes good, sometimes, uh, let's say, less good. Like in the case of Cotter Bay in, Montene in Montenegro, showed in the, in the picture, which faces as many other cultural sites across the world, some of them were shown also in the presentation before, an issue of over tourism. And tourism is uh, an economic question. <clears throat> so, heritage is definitely a source of economic effects, which could be direct, like creating uh, employment, or indirect, like conservation services or same tourism services. Just to give you a figure, we made last year the economic impact assessment of the Museo Egizio in Turin, uh, which cost around 10 million of euros per year for its management, and which is able to generate, thanks to the so-called multiplier effect, uh, a total volume of economic impact of 187 million of euros per year, which sounds quite uh, uh, impressive. So, heritage counts, but it is exposed, obviously, to all the changes we mentioned at the beginning. So let's take the case of natural disasters, most of them being driven or caused by climate change. Catastrophes, as the map shows, are increasing in frequencies almost everywhere worldwide. And they increase also in, in, in the related cost from the 138 US billion in 2010 to an overall esti uh, estimation of 431 uh, US dollars billion in 2030. So all these big changes are creating huge impacts. And it's not just about the damages, which are often the most evident part to see. It's especially about the losses, like lowering the economic flows, affecting employment, impacting our quality of life. Another figure, during the pandemic, Italian state and museums, only the ones owned by the state, were losing something like 20 million of euros per month, which again is, is, is very huge. So for all these reasons, there is now an increasing demand for avoiding or at least reducing the negative effects of change. In another word, it's resilience. So heritage has the capacity to play to all its related services and goods, an active role in doing this. In other words, in enhancing resilience. For instance, by strengthening identity and social cohesion, 
by acting as symbols of continuity within a community, like in the case we all know of the Mosser Bridge reconstruction, or by acting as iconic assets for raising public concern and enthusiasm, like in the objectives of the current UNESCO Al Nuri Mosque reconstruction project in, in Mosul. By ensuring the continuity of the traditional knowledge and skills, especially indigenous knowledge accumulated over centuries of adaptation to the local environment, like in the case of the Kalasha Valley community in Pakistan, where also we are running currently a project, or by reducing disasters through traditional resistant, easy to repair systems, able to build longer term resilience, like we did in Piemonte, which is a region periodically affected by severe floodings, or more by providing occasion to be a source of interpretation and useful information, like in the frame of the lighthouse resilience strategy of the city of Genova, again in Italy, where heritage is approached to play a crucial role in empowering the involvement of citizens towards building a community-based resilience. By playing as an economic asset for recovery, it's, for instance, related to the capacity, especially of intangible cultural heritage, to provide economic means for the recovery of communities affected by disasters or wars, like in the case of the, the Damascene Rose that you see in this picture, intangible cultural heritage in Syria, which was recognized last year by UNESCO. And it was recognized especially as an exemplary work uh, for boosting economic recovery or by offering room for innovative solutions, also in relation to the organizational process, like in the Bayanian tradition in the Philippines of helping each other in moving houses to repair them from typhoons. Again, by giving opportunities for raising awareness to attracting youth and investing on them and their future. This is what, for instance, the Monviso region is doing with the UNESCO Youth Camp. So uh, the last, uh, uh, sorry, the list might be much longer, but concluding, uh, join, joining action and finding innovative solutions are the ways to approach the role of heritage towards empowering our resiliency capacity towards the big changes we are all called, called to face now and in the next future. Thank you. Thank you, Eliseo, for your very insightful presentation. Uh, you nicely explained through various examples how heritage can contribute towards building socio-economic resilience of people. Uh, you rightly mentioned that it is important to consider heritage as an asset or a capital that can go a long way in improving the lives of the people. And it is not just limited to brick and mortar that uh, has to be mainly preserved for posterity. Very importantly, as you mentioned, there is much room for innovative solutions for the future based on traditional knowledge and organizational skills that have evolved over time based on grounded experience. So let me thank uh, once again, all our panelists for their stimulating presentations. Before I take up questions from the audience, I would like to pose a question to all the panelists and request them to respond. So may I first uh, request all the panelists to kindly uh, open their cameras so we can all see them. And uh, now uh, I would be requesting uh, each panelist to respond to the, to the question I'm gonna pose. So let me uh, first pose the question, which is like, according to you, uh, what is the main takeaway on how, uh, we should approach heritage in post-COVID world from the lens of resilience. And maybe I will uh, request uh, Ksenia to uh, maybe give her view on this uh, issue. Thank you, Rohit. Um, it, it's a difficult question, uh, you know, <laughs> impossible to answer, just like defining resilience. But I think for me, the, the key takeaway message is that we need to understand what the role of resilience is uh, when it comes to the weaknesses and strengths of the communities within which um, that you know heritage um, is located. So, does it give the community? Does heritage give the community strength, 
or is it its weakness like we've seen for example with the fall of tourism um, and how that can be addressed and I think then we would be able to understand what we can do in that sense thank you thank you very much uh, Ksenia um, Alessio maybe uh, I may ask you uh, to respond Yes, uh, COVID is not directly related to, to, to heritage. I mean, not the physical dimension of it, but of course to people, obviously it was. Uh, and it, it affects and is going to affect, we don't know uh, how much longer, our behavior. So I would say that we must pay a special attention to, to, to the social, communitarian, uh, intangible values, dimension, and, and implications uh, of heritage and especially on their capacity to enforce communities towards identity, sense of belonging, capacity to activate economic recovery. So today, more than ever in this emergency, I feel heritage conservation and management are clearly some responsibility and some opportunity related to our future, much more than our past. Very interesting. Thank you very much, Alessio. So Bill, how, what, how would you react to this? Well, I think what the, uh, the Lake District example shows that in some cases, the status quo just isn't working and trying to hold the line just won't work. It's impossible. And what really leaps out at me thinking about COVID and the COVID response and uh, where we need to be is the importance of good public policy in terms of the in terms of, of culture and heritage the importance of good public policy to drive and support a just transition where change is needed and in a post covid world we're going to need public policy and good public policy to to reinvest and, and rebuild and that's going to be at the heart of that kind of global drive but it's also at the heart of um, that fair and just transition that we we kind of uh, need um, because we just can't hold the line. And by fair and just, I mean one that builds on local tra traditions and skills, the type of things that are celebrated in World Heritage Convention, not replaces them. And those skills and traditions can then be energised to be at the forefront of, of kind of building that change and transition. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. So, Leticia, how would you react? Um... A lot of the colleagues have said some of the things that I would really uh, deeply agree with. But I, I think to me, I would say that we need to take into account uncertainty in our way of thinking. Uh, we are living in, uh, in a world that is much more connected and we have seen how fast the COVID-19 spread across the world because of these connections. Uh, that is much more complex uh, and that we, um, that what I said, and that there will always be in the middle of all this, we can't, things are very complex. We can't understand um, it all. So we need to account for those black swan events. We need to account for uncertainty. On that, that doesn't mean that we are completely sort of like uh, harm. We can't do anything about it, which I just think we need to be much more proactive and we need to start having discussions of what does this mean like in the, if we go down this path? Uh, each time that we do something, think on the long-term consequences of it. Thank you very much, uh, Leticia. So um, uh, we have received many interesting questions and comments from the audience. So uh, it's very difficult to take all of them because we have limited time available. Uh, but anyways, um, I uh, would like to pose some questions to our panelists. Uh, and uh, so let's, uh, uh, let me first pose a question to Bill. Um, so Bill, there, there's a question for you uh, that uh, it sounds like a way forward is possible. Uh, but uh, the question is like people need convincing in order to move forward. And uh, what, according to you, works best to change mindsets? Because that's something which, as you mentioned, is really needed to make a change. To change mindsets, I think um, we need a bottom-up approach. So we need people to come together at the community level, um, along with policymakers and NGOs and different actors 
but we need to come together at that community level. If we start to individually um, propose solutions and then either impose them or be seen to impose those solutions on the communities, they fail. Every single time they fail. So unless we can find different ways of working together at that kind of community ground level and, and co-develop a kind of a vision for the future, what good looks like, we're going to continue on this kind of treadmill of coming up with new ideas and just not landing well and being resisted. So we do need that new bottom-up community-based approach. Right. Thank you very much. So, Kasinia, uh, uh, this is a question uh, which is um, uh, addressed to you. How can heritage contribute to the resilience of society advancing the persistence, adaptation and transformation as the as the key, you know, principles as was uh, like um, mentioned before. So would you like from the perspective of disaster risk, how do you think uh, heritage can contribute? I think heritage has a really important role to play because it has a lot of meaning um, and, you know, it has a lot of value in a sense that um, it, it can sort of bring us back to that normal, right, whatever contested normal, but but let's call it normal for now, uh, because people can relate to that. So if um, the heritage, the meaning of the heritage can be brought forward, right, it allows people to, to kind of to transform and to take it with them, particularly when it comes to intangible heritage. Um, but I, I agree absolutely with, Bill, with what Bill has just said, in that we cannot um, have that meaning unless we know, unless we ask people who want to use the meaning and determine the meaning. And very often, again, we know that heritage can be contested. So the meaning of the same place or the same rituals can be very different to different groups. And it's important that we hear those voices and we listen to those voices, not just hear those voices, but we listen to those voices because that is the only way to, um, you know, to become better and to, be, to build resilience for choice of a better word. <laughs> so there's this connected question to you only, which is like, there's a lot of mention about build back better. And uh, it's used by politicians as well. So how can you ensure a positive, sustainable development meaning of this word better? Like, well, how can we qualify this better, the term better? To me as well, sorry. I've, I've, yes, so, yeah, so sorry, so the internet broke. The, the, the thing yeah. about building back better. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. um, well, in, indeed, right? It's Well, it's the question of better for whom and who decides what's better. I think once we answer that for whom question, we will be able to um, to to really build back better. But unfortunately, the decisions that are made, and I think we have seen it now in the past few months, is that they're not um, made um, better for those who really need that better to happen. Um, there, you know, and this is neoliberalism, unfortunately, coming um, to fruition. Thank you, Ksenia. Uh, so, Leticia, the question for you is like, how can we implement these resilience ideas that you shared in the best possible way? So, uh, about implementation, like, how can we put it into practice? So uh, maybe you would like to reflect on that. That's quite a large question. Um, as I said, I think, well, in my presentation, because we only had a very short uh, time frame, I had to, as I was discussing before with Rohit, we had to do some sort of like cut some corners. But I think it's this idea that, um, that uh, it's very linked to the, the, the resilience concept of uh, complex systems. And seeing heritage places as concept, complex systems, but in terms of heritage, we always want in that system to maintain identity. So it's not just you know just like let's think change for the sake of changing, but it's to see okay if we want to maintain the identity of the system, what are the things that we absolutely need to ensure that persists, but also seeing because we don't want that uh, system to re, uh, re turn into an undesired state to say, okay, for that system to continue maintaining their identity, but continue to evolving, what are the things that we need to let uh, adapt and need to let transform? But as I said, within this framework of, we want the identity of that system to remain. 
So I think it's looking at things in the set simultaneously. It's not either one or the other. It's to see how do we put all of those things together. And as I said, again, to the fact of uncertainty, we cannot control completely things because when we try to control things, they kind of like go into a trajectory that might not be the one we want. Thank you very much. Uh, Alicia, for you, uh, so the question is looking forward, the economic outlook as is bleak, you know, as we see now, uh, as is projected. So, and um, there will be dramatic social impacts uh, uh, because of that. So uh, can you comment further on what role you see for heritage in social and economic recovery? Should we be looking at non-monetary impacts in this, uh, in this context? So, yes, Alice. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Roy, thank you. That's, that's a very uh, appropriate uh, question, of course. Uh, and we need, we need to try to uh, address these kind of big questions uh, according to the uncertainty that we are all uh, living in, in, in this period. There is, uh, there is currently in Italy uh, a quite an interesting debate uh, of, of, on if heritage sites uh, should be considered as, uh, let's say, an enterprises, you know, in, in, according to the, the, the financial and, and taxation uh, question that the government is, is willing, let's see, to, to adopt. Of course, some heritage sites are producing a lot of uh, economics in, impact. Uh, so from an, an economic point of view, yes, they could be comparable to, to enterprise. But of course, uh, the capacity of, of heritage to work with the society is much more larger, complex, articulated than just the numbers. So I think the point is really to try to reconnect uh, heritage with the society. Sometimes it isn't connected, sometimes it's, it's detached or very detached. So uh, connect heritage with, with the problems of, of people, of communities, with their needs. In my, in my work, in my belief, in my work uh, every day, uh, we, we try, I, I say not just me, but our group, we try to address cultural projects, so projects based on cultural heritage as real development project. And of course, uh, uh, trying to, to stress as much as possible the capacity to, yes, produce interesting numbers because there is no development without also the economic side of development, but also it's, uh, it's about uh, what we, we, we have been discussing during this, this hour. It's about uh, society, identity, uh, opportunities, uh, new generation. So it's much larger, not just, not just numbers. Thank you very much, Alessio. So I would like to thank all the panelists for their presentations and uh, also for answering these interesting uh, questions posed by our audience. Um, so uh, let me uh, mention here that uh, ECROM has recognized the importance of resilience with respect to heritage in its activities and, and programs um, in 2013. Uh, ECROM collaborated with its partner to bring out publication with the theme of heritage and resilience during the third global platform on disaster risk reduction. Resilience is also one of the central themes of two of our flagship programs, uh, namely World Heritage Leadership Program, uh, which actually has one of the modules uh, dedicated to uh, resilience and also another flagship program called First Aid and Resilience for Cultural Heritage in Times of Crisis. Um, so we will continue to engage with you to take this discussion forward for the healthy future of heritage and its bear bearers. Uh, before concluding uh, this webinar, I would also like to once again express uh, gratitude to all our panelists and also our organizing team here at ECROM that has been working hard to bring these webinars to you under these uh, special situation. We also thank all the attendees for participating in the webinar and raising important questions. The recorded version of this webinar will shortly be made available on ECROM website. Please note that the recordings of all the previous webinars are available at ECROM lecture series page uh, on, and also on the ECROM YouTube channel. 
Uh, information on our future webinars is available at our website as well and also on other social media uh, platforms. So I would also take this uh, opportunity to uh, announce a webinar, which is uh, um, just a second, let me share the screen again. Um, I would like to announce the uh, webinar, uh, which is uh, on the uh, psychosocial support during crisis. Uh, this is uh, scheduled uh, tomorrow at 2 p.m. Central, Central European time. Uh, this webinar is held as part of the series of ECROMS International Program on First Aid and Resilience in Times of Crisis. So uh, I would like to uh, thank you all once again for being with us. It has been a very, very fruitful uh, webinar. Uh, we have managed to discuss quite a bit of issues in a very limited time frame. And uh, it is very useful for ECROM to continue to develop our activities uh, in line with the current needs and current issues. So uh, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, please stay safe. Uh, goodbye. Thank you.